Rudell has a BA from Montana State University and an MFA from UC Irvine. His work has been exhibited in solo and group exhibitions nationally and internationally, including Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, New Museum of Contemporary Art New York City, the Museo Cantonal de Art Lugano, Switzerland, the Ponza Collection, Varese, Italy, Muse Museo di Art Trento, Italy, Angeles Gallery, Los Angeles, Studio La Cita, Verona, Italy, and Jack Shaneman Gallery, New York. His most recent solo show, Zero Zero, opened at Bake Art in Los Angeles in November 2017. I'd like to thank Ross Rudell for visiting the department and for the time he has spent with sculpture so far. Please join me in welcoming Ross Rudell to Cranbrook. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's take a vote. Or let's see, who, uh, what, no. That was my stomach growling from uh, about five years ago. I did a recording and I'd never, I, I thought there's gonna be a really good sound system here, so I thought I'd try it out, so. Um, okay, uh, I grew up in the mountains of Montana and South Dakota. I was an avid skier, mountaineer, and cave crawler. Uh, when I was an undergraduate at Montana State, uh, I had a professor tell me that the most important thing as an artist is to stay in motion. Uh, but I tend to move in overlapping circles. Uh, as you'll see, I'm obsessed with symmetry and finding balance. Uh, I'm nocturnal. I split my day and night. Um, I consider my daytime activities terrestrial and my nighttime activities celestial, and I make my art at night. Um, I do uh, basically weekly runs up in Griffith Park in, uh, in Los Angeles to Mount Hollywood, the highest point you can see there. Um, I aim to get to the uh, summit of Mount Hollywood right at sundown, and I'm kind of, I'm really good at this. I can vary my pace slightly so that I, I pull this off, but uh, so I run up in the, uh, in the daylight, uh, catch the sunset, I meditate and do a little ceremony up on the summit, um, and then I run down in the twilight, um, in the sundown, and by the time I reach the bottom, it's twilight. Um, on, let's see, um, on full moons, I do, um, oh, and I should say my routes, uh, all of my routes up there are designed to be either circles or figure eights. Um, on full moons, uh, generally I run at midnight and, uh, and run entirely by moonlight. And on the solstice and equinox full moons, I do that nude. Um, um, Joshua Tree National Park is out uh, east of uh, east of Los Angeles, and I spent a lot of time out there meandering, again, always doing cir circular hikes uh, in this area called the, one primarily in this area called the Wonderland of Rocks. Um, so, it, let's see. Okay. Right. Over time, uh, these circles and loops have overlapped. Uh, which I find to be a wonderful metaphor for life in general and in particular as, as my practice as an artist. Okay. Uh, that is a Joshua tree, by the way. They're very, outside of the wonderland of rocks, these things uh, occupy most of the park and they are the coolest. Uh, and, and the wonderland of rocks is just this incredibly surreal, uh, the whole park is uh, like an acid trip. Um, given my interest in nighttime activity, it's not surprising that the moon has been a recurring subject in my work. Um, this is a stump that I, well, I'm going to talk a little bit briefly just so that you understand that just about every, everything that you're going to see is wood, unless I specify otherwise. Um, from various sources, uh, early in my career, I would um, get wood from a wood supplier, laminate things up to get them large enough, but lately, in the past decade or so, I have been acquire, or locating wood. People, friends tell me where to find logs, um, so I'm wandering around LA. I think Rebecca actually pointed me to this stump many, many years ago. Um, and so everything that I carve, most of what I carve has a history that, I have history with the material that somehow informs the work is integrated into the work, 
in my mind, um, opens up a span of time that imbues the work. Um, and the that is just the, um, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the layering that all of my work uh, tends to have with personal history for me. Uh, but this log, I had it for, it sat outside my studio, didn't know what to do with it. It was really resistant uh, to me coming to any conclusions with it. But it had a rotten core. Um, it had been termited, uh, ridden, and that's what killed the tree. Um, and one day I was just out compulsively with a drill and a spade bit, uh, a 7 8 inch spade bit, and I just started going at it like a dentist, um, removing everything that was soft, taking all of the decay out of it. And I actually tried to tell my dentist this story while he was working on you know, because I thought, this, you'd love this. Um, but as a result, I ended up carving all the way up into the top of the, uh, through the hollowed out all the way up to the top. Um, and then that left the drill hole. So it sat outside my studio for another a few months. And then finally, I, I walked by and I thought, that's about a quarter. So I put, um, I stuck a quarter in there and sure enough, it, they were perfect fits. Um, so I, whoops, I went the wrong way. So I uh, patinaed quarters, inserted them into the holes and if you follow, and this requires a, a physical action, you have to get underneath the piece and, and literally bend down and, and follow the money up in and at the very top, what you're seeing there is a hole uh, and what you're seeing is the wall illuminated above the artwork. So as long as it's uh, presented in a white walled ex uh, exhibit and lit well, that moon illuminates itself. And there's just a, an acrylic lens over that hole that I went with um, a stick pin. And over time just kept picking, uh, poking at it with a stick pin and rubbing India ink into it until I built up the craters of the moon. And um, you know, it requires a leap of faith, but what I aspire to do is, um, is to create something that, that with a leap of faith, you, there, I can get the true experience of uh, looking at the moon with this, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. So. Um, I, <laughs> I live, uh, my studio sits next to the Los Angeles River, and I was never really that much into birds until I uh, bought this building, and, and over time, I've become a bird guy. I uh, started with a rooster that wandered into my life, um, but I've rescued waterfowl but, and, and pigeons, lots of sick pigeons. The pigeons actually, the word's out. If, if you're sick and, you're, and you need help, you go and you land in Ross's parking lot, and eventually he'll get you into the aviary. I have uh, two aviaries behind my studio. Uh, I think it's currently I have 16 permanent residents back there. Um, and one day I needed to, I, I wanted to renovate one of those two uh, aviaries and I was trying to figure out what the hell I would do with the birds while I was working on it. I thought, well, how much, how much damage could pigeons do in one day? <laughs> um, so. <laughs> um, so I made this piece, uh, and you know, and, and as I do clean the uh, the aviaries, I, I, you know, the pigeons roost in specific places. So over time, they do the poops start to build up. And I started to think, and given my history as a uh, spelunker, as a cave crawler, um, I figured, you know, eventually they're going to create stalag stalagmites. Um, so I set about making this piece, which took a couple of months to do, um, or longer, uh, doing a poop a day. Uh, on this pedestal, and it's uh, gypsum cement mixed uh, with some pigments mixed in to get the right consistency and color. And I just do a poop a day and just built it up over time. The piece is about six feet tall. And a friend of mine, <laughs> I told a friend of mine that I was doing this piece, and he said, that rings a bell. And so he sent me this picture, and lo and behold, it actually happens. <laughs> Okay, this, uh, there's a uh, significant story behind this simple piece, um, but this is one where all of these materials come into play. Okay, I'm gonna try to uh, make this as brief as I can, but uh, uh, some time ago I was in my neighborhood and I came, I, there was a storefront that had uh, uh, African, apparently African fetish carvings in the window, curtained behind so I could never see into it. The place was never open. Uh, one day I saw the door was open and I went in with a friend and 
Um, and the proprietor came, and we went into what was sort of a gift shop of sorts, and, and the proprietor came and asked uh, what our interest was, and I said the carvings, and he found out I was a carver, and he said, well, I'd, uh, I'd like to invite you into the back. And what we walked into, it turns out, was a Yoruba sanctuary. Uh, Yoruba, as I understand it, is the African predecessor to voodoo. And uh, he took me, as we were going down a hallway, I heard someone speaking in tongues off in a darkened uh, office, and we went to the back um, into what was the sanctuary of the Yoruba church there. And along the walls, there was a shelf with uh, ceremonial vessels, wooden carved ceremonial vessels. And as I was looking at them, I realized that there was blood ritual involved with these. And given my association with uh, animals, this, you know, this wasn't going well. Uh, but he asked if I would be interested in carving, making vessels for them. And I, you know, so as I was leaving, I was thinking, well, I'll probably end up making one just to, you know, appease the gods. Anyway, we go back to the front, and now there are uh, four people in the front. One very large man with three people, uh, uh, with three other people. I was introduced to the man. He is a Yoruba priest. Um, I, I wish I was meant to research this. I've, I've forgotten what country the origin of Yoruba is, but. He spends four months out of the year as the local priest, four months out of the year teaching uh, religious studies at Harvard, four months out of the year doing divinations across the, the US. And that's what I happened to be listening to. The three people with, that were with him were uh, his acolytes who were traveling and learning with him. Okay, so we left and I took my friend home. I was backing, I, she lived in a back house. I was backing, I dropped her off. I was backing out of her driveway and in my rear view mirror, there was a hawk. This is in the middle of Los Angeles. There was a hawk standing in the driveway blocking my path. And I checked my mirror to be sure I was right. Sure enough, I got out and, and had this extensive psychic inter, interface with this bird. It had a dead pigeon in its talons. Uh, and after a, a good deal of time, it, it took flight, flew over my head. Just, I pretty much had to duck to avoid it. And it flew off over the trees towards the Los Angeles River. So I drive home, um, pull into my parking lot, and the fellow that I own my building with was standing in the parking lot with a pair of binoculars. And I jumped out of my car and I said, Don, I've got this amazing story for you. And he said, yeah, but you gotta see this. He said, okay, so remember there was uh, the priest and his three acolytes. He said, there are four pigeon, or there are four hawks up here and there, one of them has something in its talons and it's doing circles over my studio. <laughs> um, my hair was on end. Um, so I, Wanted to conclude this, so I made this piece <laughs> that is just packed. I, I packed it with everything I could that was uh, of spiritual significance to me. The fabric is uh, uh, belonged to my deceased brother. Uh, the wood that I made the box uh, out of was a tree that was split in half by lightning in Griffith Park. Uh, the the what the two whole things are are claws to fit my index finger and my thumb, my opposing digits, uh, rendering my, my hand useless for anything but predation. Um, and the, uh, the claws themselves were made from antler for, that I uh, got from the Black Hills in South Dakota that is my spiritual center. Um, and I got this done, closed the box, and walked away from it. So. And these three uh, objects were part of an installation that I did at Art Center uh, called Urban Nature, uh, curated by Constance Mallinson. Okay. Uh, dreams uh, make their, you know, when, when significant dreams that I remember uh, inspire me to make work, I'll do work based on dreams. Um, this piece, I was in the, in my, in the dream, I came, I was touring a, um, a uh, a collector's home, and this home was just breathtaking, but I turned a corner and I saw this artwork on the wall. And I was just blown away by it, and I spent the rest of the night obsessed in my dream with how I could plagiarize that idea and get away with it. Uh, so when I woke up, I set about plagiarizing the dream. So this is called the Proprietary Dream Mandala. Um, the cards are, well, first of all, it's a mandala. It, in the dream, it was a mandala. So I, uh, I realized that it, need to it needed to have numerical resolution. And it took me months to come to this. I worked on graph paper. Um, I, I suppose I could have just plugged this into a computer and had it like that. But 
<laughs> but that's not the way I roll. So uh, working with graph paper, finally had this eureka moment where it all came together where um, no matter where you put your finger on any of these cards and run concentrically or radially, uh, the, run, the, the numbers run consecutively. And when you come out to the end of a smoke, you go to the next and it rotates back in. So it's, self, it, it's perpetually self-feeding. Uh, the cards themselves, uh, I wanted them to have significance, so they were, I, I got them from a friend who got them from the Silverado Casino in Deadwood, South Dakota, after they had been played out on the, on the gaming table. So they have, in my mind, all of the residual energy of having been played out at the poker tables at the Silverado. Yeah. Um, had a dream I was in the desert and wandering around and found this a boomerang on the ground and it was huge and I tried to pick it up and I could barely even get it off the ground and had one of those moments in the dream where I was suddenly realized oh my god somebody this belongs to somebody and this person must be gigantic <laughs> so for the rest of the night I was skulking around in the shrubs avoiding whoever whomever this belonged to uh, oh whoever this belonged to <laughs> Uh, so that log, I, I went across uh, the river, uh, along, along the median of the river, and looked extensively until I found the right crook in a, in, a, in a log that I could work with, and then waited six months for it to dry, and then carved this piece. Uh, I have done a few performances over the years. Um, this uh, was done at Post Gallery in downtown LA. Um, I should tell you a little bit about this outfit um, because it's going to show up a few times. Um, it is belonged to my deceased brother, um, who was an artist um, who died in a mountaineering accident in Banff, Alberta, at the Banff Center. He was in grad school at the Banff Center. He, at Banff Center, he was a few years older than me, um, so it has influenced you know. And anyway, uh, significant um, event in my life. Uh, this belonged to him, and he did one performance in this. This is a, a World War II vintage Swiss Alpine camouflage outfit, <laughs> and it's uh, very thick felted wool. Um, and when I perform in it, I, you know, I tend to perform in it nude underneath it, so it's very, <laughs> it's very visceral. <laughs> Um, this piece uh, was called Wet Column. Uh, I stood on, I, I came into the gallery, and this was for an opening of an, of an exhibit that this was to be part of. Um, I, came, I walked in during the opening in costume, and I had bolted to the wall that wooden box that the dimensions of front and back were perfect for my head to just barely fit into. I inserted myself into this, um, and it had trap doors underneath that locked my head into place, and I, and I stood there for an hour. At the thir about the 30-minute mark, uh, fluid drained out of... Um, uh, out of the pant leg and made a puddle that made its way across this hallway and the hallway separated the main body of the exhibit from the refreshments in the back so anyone who wanted refreshments had to figure out how to negotiate the puddle. Yeah. Uh, Halloween um, it is very important to me. I, every year I spend way too much time making costumes for it uh, because there's a, in Los Angeles, um, in, on any given Halloween, there will be uh, f roughly 500,000 people in costume on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood parading back and forth and doing jello shots. And so I, you know, it gives me a, an arena um, to be anonymous and to perform and to a, a a focus, a, a, a time focus for me to aim for. So anyway, I've done, every year I try to do something, import, uh, something important to me. Uh, the mask is made of uh, algae from the Los Angeles River. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, these vultures are impeccably carved. They're about this big and, and they're right down to their little tiny nostrils. And they revolved around my head. You know. uh, every one of these eyeballs was, hand, was, was made by hand. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, what will uh, just uh, note this mask, and if any of you, some of you might be familiar with the symbol, it's the Sri Antra symbol, a tantric symbol of cosmic unity. Um, 
uh, I want you to note this now because there is some titling for work uh, uh, later in the lecture. We'll come back to this. Yeah. Okay. Um, another performance was uh, at the St. Vincent, you know, Vincent Price Museum uh, in East LA. Uh, it was part of an exhibit called Sanctified. Uh, it had work in the show and, and a number of people did performances. Um, what you see here are, um, it's a double helix uh, that's one giant loop and in totality it's about 25 feet long and the wood that was harvested to make this was of particular interest for me and the activity of getting it on the side of the freeway having to access it was uh, particularly interesting. They had to be baked in my in my, uh, anyway, the long process to get the, uh, these uh, spokes and to get them joined and to get them to structurally hold together. But it is a, a, a loop that uh, loops, uh, depending on your, which direction it's rotating, it either, uh, r the, the spiral rises up on the outside and down on the inside or vice versa. Yeah. Um, for the piece, I uh, came, in, uh, came in again off site. Um, did a spiral pirouette around the pedestal, which is a, a substantial log sitting on a pile of pillows that I envision being a, a lotus blossom, um, and pirouetted up onto the pedestal, inserted my head into my double helix, which had been pre-wound, hanging from a nylon stocking from a very high ceiling, and it was wound in advance. Um, I inserted myself into this and let it go. And it revolved around my head and it's, at its peak, it was really cooking around my head. Um, there was about three quarters of an inch all the way around my head allowance for me. So the performance was required me to uh, rehearse this incessantly uh, to get myself centered in advance of doing the piece get on the piece and maintain that. If it hit my head, it would go all kittywampus and the entire thing would have uh, been undermined. Um, and I performed this twice and was successful both times. Okay, let's see. Uh, I titled this Nebulizer. Okay, um, some of you might recognize this uh, as uh, uh, being inspired by the ceiling of the Alhambra Palace in Granada, Spain. I had a, um, uh, a really crappy Xerox uh, image of this that uh, 10 years ago, I thought I should just, you know, this is something I could love to get lost in. Um, so. Uh, I started it 10 years ago and have worked on it off and on. I work on it when I'm moved to do so. It's a, it is a process of meditation to me as uh, so much Arabic design is and is good for and was designed for. Um, if you're not familiar with the Alhambra, look it up sometime. It is so, the geometry is so compounded, it, it's, gr it's become grotto. Uh, it's, in my mind, it was just indecipherable. So I, de I decided I would make a dumb effort to learn it. Um, this is made of ash and it's about this big, uh, 16 inches point to point, I think. 15 inches probably. Um, and about three inches deep. Um, everything that I did, every chip that I made, I had to repeat 16 times. So um, it was A, I had to spend the time to figure out what my next move was. And then once it was decided, um, I, I'd have to see that through. Uh, again, I'm nocturnal in, in my studio. It's just a tremendous uh, meditation source. And, and it's unfinished. I showed it at the show at, uh, at Bake, uh, unfinished. Um, for a subsequent piece, I'll show it to you in profile. Uh, for a subsequent piece, I, it was important that I actually figure out. Oh, and ash, by the way, is just doesn't lend itself to, uh, to <laughs> um, um, 
meticulous carving. So it's, it was like it would chip and it would fall apart and it kept sticking it back with Elmer's glue. And so it was just you know, kind of a stupid enterprise that was perfect for what I intended with that piece. But it was important for a subsequent piece that I was going to do that I finally understand what the base geometry was. So I set about doing um, a drawing to really decipher it. Um, and by the time I did this last year or a year and a half ago, uh, there were now some really high-res imagery online for me to work from. Uh, so I, I did this, uh, this drawing, which is about 8 inches by 8 inches, um, with an optivizer, a magnifying optivizer, with, you know, just basically poking at it with a pencil and, uh, and understanding it. And that one spoke uh, uh, defines the entire thing. There's the, if that is repeated all the way around, the entire resolution of the Alhambra ceiling would be realized. And it was with this in mind, um, Evan Holloway has a tree out in front of his studio that he opened a gallery in. The, this hole in this tree is Dryad Gallery. And I was the third artist to, um, to exhibit in Dryad Gallery, and I was the first man to do so. Dryads are um, pagan uh, mythological entities that occupy ash trees. They're female, feminine in, in, um, in their nature, and they have a symbiotic relationship. The mythology is they have a symbiotic relationship with the tree as protectors and being protected. Um, so, of course, being the first man to do it, I needed to make a phallus to put it to, uh, to occupy the tree. Uh, but the Alhambra ceiling to me is, is in my mind uh, feminine, it's a concavity. Um, so my challenge was to figure out the geometry so that I could umbrella or blanket this phallus with the geometry, which I was successfully able to do. Um, and meticulously carved, uh, spent uh, yeah, a month and a half or two months carving this. Okay. Um, this is in the, this was in the recent show and some, I think most of the work that you'll see uh, from now on will be from the show at Bake. Um, the well, I'll talk about the title later. Um, and this piece was called Wet Slash Dry. Um, and in my, in my interest in it is that it was a linear meditation as, it, as the Alhambra was. Um, it's a binary geometry that just goes back and forth and back and forth that rotates and rotated uh, to accommodate shifts in the branch. Every time that the branch changed directions, the rotation needed to happen perfectly so that a point would occur there and then to the next. And I did half rotations between each diversion. Uh, what fascinates me about these branches is they're, they're seeking light, so they're making decisions. Each branch of a tree is making a decision or, or is seeking light relative to other branches. And that, you know, extended out throughout the tree is just really fascinating to me. Um, this tree in particular is, was, um, I love, okay, uh, uh, three o'clock in the morning one night working in my studio, I'd heard a horrendous crash outside. Uh, went out on Glendale Boulevard and found a car completely totaled by a tree that the diameter of the tree was only about this big. So this thing was really solid. He did knock the tree down, but he completely totaled his car. But uh, it's a slow growth tree that, you know, had taken, its, its pace was just so excruciatingly slow in its growth and its density so rich. And it all ended just like that. I mean, just that, that transition to me was, a, was curious. Um, and so my pace with this, and it, just this notion of reinvesting it with a slower pace, uh, all of this comes into play. Um, yeah. it, you know, it's about six feet long, comes out from the wall about five feet, four or five feet. Um, this is the first whittled piece that I've ever done. Uh, after all these years of carving, uh, I finally sat down to whittle. Um, and it was a branch that had sat in my studio for years, uh, perfectly straight line, and then a little change, and then it went straight up again. Um, and I whittled it, and, and it is that same binary ge geometry with a rapid rotation all the way through it. So the, the geometry is almost imperceptible. You, it's indecipherable. You can't really, it's hard to understand what's going on because it's so compounded. 
but my interest in this one, and the reason that it was important to show you this, is that so much of what I do is about presence, um, and that and reproductions just don't tend to um, get that across. But for me, uh, the, the most successful resolution to much of my work is that it achieves its own presence, its own reason for being, its own um, undeniability. Um, and this stupid little thing does that more than anything else I'll show you for me. And it has this sensation when you're in its presence that it just kind of came up and it's there. It's right there. Um, and it's just improbable. It, it feels like, um, um, it just feels improbable. Okay. And it is, <laughs> and it is very, it, it, and I whittled it to the extent as, as far as I could go before I, th I thought it, would, it could no longer hold itself up. Okay. Um, this has that same sort of, uh, um, Oh, it's one of my all-time favorite pieces. I'm one of the easiest ones. <laughs> you know, uh, some of the, some work I do can take you know forever to do. Others just happen in the, in the blink of an eye. I, I just had a, a notion one day to try this. I had these uh, wooden balls and I just put string on it and and spent five minutes balancing it on the wall. And Eureka! I had this thing that I think is it's just one of my favorite things ever. It's a gravity ladder, um, and it in terms of its pres that quote presence, uh, this one truly embodies it. It's um, you know, as in present in real time. There's a, uh, an active tension um, held in balance and it's so simple. And uh, you know, maybe half of the people who look at it say, of course, duh. <laughs> and the other half like me go, wow, <laughs> I can't believe that actually worked. Uh, so anyway, I, I had this in my studio for some time and, and made a uh, large version of it for the show at Bake. Bake, by the way, is um, uh, sh she has uh, Susan Bake has two different spaces in Los Angeles, and so the show is split between the two spaces. Um, okay, so this is about eight feet tall in totality. Okay, uh, back to dreams and a few pieces uh, demonstrating my environmental politics. Um, if I'm political, it's environmentally. Um, back, okay, back in 2008, had a dream that I was wandering in the desert and I came across a guy who was being beaten uh, furiously by two men in black suits, white shirts, black ties, and sunglasses. And, and so I came to his aid, and in the dream, uh, I was wrestling with one of these guys, and, and in one of those just terrifying mortal moments in the dream, he pulled a gun on me, and we're struggling for it, and I was able to turn it on him, and I shot him, and it turned out to be a squirt gun. But uh, the water caused him to disintegrate, so I just shot him until he was, uh, until he was dust, and then I went and killed the other guy. Then I went to see how the man was whose, whose aid I'd come to, and uh, he seemed to be dead on the, on the uh, desert floor. So I got down on my hands and knees, and I was listening in his chest and couldn't hear a heartbeat, but all of a sudden he, there was a rustling sound from inside, and he started sprouting vegetation from his orifices, out of his nose, his ears, his mouth. And as I backed away from him, he transformed the desert into a lush Eden, into a, uh, just this paradise. Um, I woke up from this dream, and this was 2008, early 2008. Um, I had scheduled an exhibit at a museum for uh, early 2009. Right, I knew right around the time of the inauguration of the next president. So I took this dream to be a premonition that whatever, whoever would be elected would represent a sea change in environmental politics. And remember, at this point, we're dealing with George W. Bush, who was just atrocious um, with environmental politics. So. Uh, so I, um, I decided I would have to do a piece commemorating the dream and, um, and commemorating uh, the next president. Um, this, let's see, again, my studio sits next to the LA River. Um, it runs through these annual cycles that are just uh, sort of breathtaking. Uh, in the winter, uh, early winter, Horrendous rains cause just an enormous flood to go through there every year. Every time it rains, I was telling somebody earlier that I once heard that uh, what goes through the channel after a hard rain, there's more water going through there, that, through there than over Niagara Falls. And it's at a, a very steep pitch, so it's just flying. 
Um, and, oh, and I should say that the Los Angeles River for the vast majority of its length is just a concrete channel, but for about a five mile stretch on either side of my studio, it has a natural floor. So concrete edges, but a natural floor. Um, I take it upon myself to take care of a stretch of that. But, uh, so the, the floods come, they purge everything uh, before the plastic bag ban. Everything that remained standing was festooned with plastic bags and, um, and so it looks hideous, but then it starts to sprout and it just re, re, it's reborn every spring and you know through the summer and in the fall starts to die back and then the floods come. So it's just this uh, regenerative cycle that's just such a beautiful illustration right out my back door. Um, which are all, everything I've described is the description of um, uh, the mythical green man, the uh, sort of pop icon for environmentalists. Uh, but there are, there is a pagan mythology history to this that reveals itself across Europe uh, in a lot of medieval castles. Um, this guy is made entirely of algae. The, the algae that you just saw in the last image, I harvested, uh, dried behind my studio, and I just mixed it with uh, Elmer's glue. Uh, had, a, had a friend, Rebecca, actually years ago, made a mold of my head in order to do it. I was a cheap model. <laughs> so, um, but there's not, he's made of nothing but uh, Elmer's glue and algae from the Los Angeles River. Uh, called him emissary for that show, and the show opened the day after the inauguration of Obama. So everything worked perfectly, so the dream was true. Okay, uh, fast forward eight years, um, I posted this the night that Trump was elected, <laughs> um, and I knew with this show coming up that I'd need to do a, um, a second version of the resurrection, uh, or, or, uh, but titled it uh, Murder. And did the same, and what I love about this, it's the same mold, same algae, and you remember back in the dream, uh, I was able to uh, kill the assailants with a squirt gun. The way that I got this to, to uh, die in the barrel was I made the original cast of myself and shot myself with a squirt gun, and I slowly just, because it's Elmer's glue, it just reconstituted, so I just kind of went back. Um, and I was, I kept thinking of the uh, Jacques-Louis David's um, death of Marat as I was doing this, so trying to capture that um, expression and posture. There. And I'm looking forward to 2020 when I'm hoping to create a green woman. Uh, going back to um, the first piece that you saw, um, it is my take on the um, Ouroboros, the snake eating its tail, but I've, I have anthropomorphized it and sexualized it, and, uh, and it keeps coming back to me in various forms. Uh, this was the very first one I did. It was probably right around 1990 or a little later. Um, but so for, uh, in honor of uh, Trump in office and um, 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 Zinke and uh, who's the, yeah, the EPA, who's, who's in charge of the EPA? Pruitt, uh, in charge of Zink, uh, in, in honor of Zinke, Pruitt, and Trump, I killed the Ouroboros, it's a dead or dying Ouroboros that was in the last show. Yeah. Okay, um, on to the, the main installation of the show, and there's a backstory here. I was in the midst of making these objects uh, that were about uh, spears interacting, and I knew this was coming, but I, I didn't really put it all together until I was fully engaged in the activity. I made the trip up to um, South Dakota and went uh, for the solar eclipse, um, went up to my hometown, to Rapid City, South Dakota, and rented a car and drove south to the border of Wyoming and Nebraska to the Agate and Fossil National Monument. Um, and this place, you know, the, the monument would probably get on average 10 cars a day. There were at least 10,000 cars there by the time I got there early in the morning. But here I am trucking uh, due uh, west along the highway, heading, heading to the monument and Along the highway, all of the sunflowers, which there were millions of, were all facing the sunrise behind me. So as I'm driving west, I'm heading to the solar eclipse, and I've got millions of sunflowers smiling at me as I'm driving along the highway. Uh, turn south, um, 
got to the monument, uh, found a parking space, and just promptly took off and donned my backpack and took off across the prairie and hiked for two and a half hours, um, pretty much in a straight line until I was uh, on a what served as a plateau and, and the partial eclipse started where I just hunkered down and waited for it to occur. Um, you know, leading right up to the moment of, of totality, I was thinking, this is great, this is great, but I've experienced this before, I hope this is, you know, I hope this is gonna be good, and the second it happened, it just rocked my world. Um, if you've not experienced one, if you have an opportunity in your lifetime, highly recommend it. Um, so, <laughs> here I am on the prairie, absolute singularity. Um, I should explain the experience again. I'm sure you've heard from somebody, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, black circle, jet black circle in the sky, uh, white halation around it, um, pitch dark around that, segueing into twilight and stars. And in the in the dark, there's uh, plenty of stars. Segueing into twilight, segueing into sunset, and it's 360 degrees around you. It's as if you are the center of the universe and the singularity of having the sun, the moon, you and the earth all in line for that seven minutes is just beyond belief. And, and the significance that it had relative to this work that I was doing for this show um, was uh, really conspicuous uh, as I thought about it. On my hike out, still uh, partial eclipse, I'm wandering across the prairie and I come across this, this thing's 50 feet in diameter in the grass. I have no idea what could account for this. I'm sure if I asked a biologist, they'd tell me in an instant, but I don't wanna know. <laughs> it's a celestial crop circle, but it happened just on my behalf, on my way out from the uh, total eclipse. So this piece I was working on prior to uh, going down there and was thinking somewhat about the eclipse and you know, the, the notion of two celestial spheres having intercourse or, or merging. Um, and this was the title piece for the show. And it's not exactly zero, zero. I, 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 didn't, I couldn't find language for this work that I was doing or uh, symbols that, that made sense. So it, the zero, zero is in the tradition of prints. It's just a visual uh, to circles, elongated circles next to each other. Um, and the subsequent work will go back to titling, uh, will go back to the Sri Antra with that. But this is, and this is large, this is uh, six, 16 inches in diameter, solid wood carved and painted. Um, how am I doing? Okay. Um, this piece was on my wall, carved it uh, a couple of years ago uh, on a whim, uh, after you know, just knowing that from looking at Gray's Anatomy and all my other anatomy books, how beautiful the reproductive system, the female reproductive system was, how paisley-like it was, and how rich in motion it was. And uh, so I made this carving. Um, it sat on the wall for a month or so. And just so we are, how does this work? Oh, I'll bet I poke it there. Is this, there we go. Nope. Oop. Oh, okay. Um, uh, because I've, I've learned in doing the exhibit and talking to people in the show, there are a lot of people who just can't even recognize this. Uh, um, rectum, uh, vagina, uterus, bladder, uh, um, uh, clitoris, pelvic bone. Okay. Had this on the wall, finally decided, oh, and, I, and my idea when I did this was, you know, I was thinking I was gonna make this carving, uh, prime it, and then do a, a psychedelic Peter Max type painting on the surface. But as soon as I primed it, I just fell in love with this. It was just, it, it resolved itself as, was, as it was. Uh, then I decided that, of course, it needed a partner. So I made the man. Um, okay, penis is obvious, scrotum, um, uh, testicle, rectum, uh, prostate, bladder, I guess that about something, a pelvic bone, okay. Uh, that's a gland up there, I don't know what that's called. I think semen is generated from that. Okay, so now I've got these two, and in this orientation in my studio, they sat on the wall for a long, a, probably a full year, um, but and, and with this sort of clamshell presentation that is if the, the mer merge them, the two of them would become a, a whole. Um, so that led to my thinking, okay, 
how would they interact? What would the intercourse look like for these? And so I started a series of drawings. Um, this was the first of them that I did, and this is missionary, and, and it's okay. It's kind of cool the way they merge, but they, don't, they aren't really getting in sync. So, but subsequent drawings just kind of got more and more fluid, became more and more symbolically rich. Um, okay. Oh, let me go back to that. I mean, there's, a, uh, there's an inherent yin-yang in this. Um, there is an infinity symbol. It's the uh, Mobius strip. It's just got all, all of these things come into play just through this drawing. Um, and these were generational. I was doing them on paper uh, and then laying, trace, uh, doing tracing paper from them so that I could then lay that into another drawing. And so I, before I knew it, I just had this massive stack of drawings. Um, and, and you know, again, these sim symbology just comes into play. The um, a, a heptad, a seven-sided polygon um, um, in Wiccan pagan uh, tradition. I, the seven-pointed star is the fairy star. Uh, it was pointed out to me that the women weren't getting enough enjoyment out of it, so I had to figure out how to do a cross section of a head and and get that involved. But this rotation, this beautiful rotation, and uh, where's my gizmo? Um, if you connect this to this and add a torso, uh, this is fully defined. It's as if this has been removed and just squeezed down. And that repeated, that comes up in a few of these. Um, but I guess everything you need to know is here. Uh, and these were drawn to the scale of the carvings, the original carvings. All right, so then, you know, from those, I started doing uh, a few carvings. Uh, well, I'll talk more about the physical aspects of Bake Gallery, but knowing uh, how this was going to uh, lay out in Bake, I figured I could do three more carvings. So I chose from the drawing three um, of the from the drawings three that I could do carvings from. Each of the carvings was made from a different sourced piece of wood, each of which I had a history with. Uh, to varying degrees of, um, of depth in, 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 in my personal relationship with it. But all of them, you know, there's, that came into play as well. Uh, so this was a carving of that first one that I talked about with the, you can see how now that rotation is just so gorgeous and that the piece of wood is beautiful. This is the only one that I actually, this is, uh, the wood is ash, and it's the only one that I can, I, that I can absolutely identify the wood. Uh, these came out of the wall at uh, about 45 degrees, and, and were hung, you know, right in this vicinity, so they got you right in the gut, basically. Uh, okay, Bake is a, uh, was a mechanics garage in, in, uh, in the past, and, um, prior incarnation, and it of course had a ramp going across it so mechanics could work underneath it. So it's a pit, and, um, and I've always loved that, and so I always wanted to show in this space. Uh, Susan Bake took it on, I developed a relationship with her, she agreed to do this. But you have to commit to going into the show, so I love that notion that you know, the commitment to dive into this was of, was of particular interest to me, but uh, knowing also that uh, from this point I could make these pieces so that they would only be revealed to you as you went down and rotated through the space. And I kind of like the idea of, uh, and do this frequently, where the installation of my work uh, either dictates or rewards certain motion, and it, it just spiral into the space. Um, the drawings, let's see, well, we'll get to that. I don't know if you can see any of the drawings here, but because it's a pit, uh, because you're dropping down six or eight feet, um, you're already, it's gonna extend the ceiling, but the ceiling was um, uh, exceedingly high anyway. So there were 18 foot walls. Um, so you're, you're diving in, which just elevates those into a celestial area. So the drawings uh, ended up being superimposed, uh, which was the final culmination of the drawings. I did all those generations leading up to the two nights prior to the opening of the show where I went in with a massive ladder and did one more graphite transfer where I put the drawings on the wall, inserted graphite paper behind them and drew them one more time. 
the, um, the fascination for me with these drawings is that this repetitive motion, repetitive motion, I, it, it's so understood by me now that this, it in, it in and of itself is a meditation. And I should say that the other, um, <laughs> I, um, it was, uh, Carmine Nyan County, who wrote about my work uh, one time, saying that Ross plays a brinksmanship between propriety and what, and what propriety would deem vulgar. Um, I'm working in the middle of the night, having intercourse with these sculptures. Uh, they're so hands-on. There's so much handwork in them, and I'm so physically invested in them that there's um, that you know this action, the final action of doing these drawings was just like a culmination of a long process, long and rich and marvelous process. Um, and with this, uh, you can see some of the drawings. And the drawings, what was really successful about them that I could not have anticipated in advance is uh, um, that they were very ethereal. You would look up, one would be, you'd see one, and you wouldn't initially see them. Uh, you'd go into the pit, and then you'd see one, and then another one would re reveal, and that one would disappear, and they were just ethereal enough that they just kind of um, fluctuated in the space. Okay, um, I'm gonna rifle through these. This is probably the most rewarding piece from the show, and the next step in this evolution was to literally try to ver emerge male and female. I researched unisexuals, uh, but came to the, an image of um, uh, embryonic genitalia just prior to differentiation, just before we become either male or female. Uh, the genitalia has aspects of both. If, uh, if this were to become male, um, this would extend and become the penis, this would heal, and this would become the scrotum. Um, if, if it goes female, this would recede, become the clitoris, this would open up to create the vulva. Um, but this, what was so rewarding about this is that this re required everything I know about carving, all of my entire history, um, I, all the knowledge I had in order for this to work, and it all came together just perfectly, where the grain, everything was concentric to the form, I needed to see into the, into the wood to know that this was gonna, uh, that the grain was gonna work, that the shape was, was contained within it, and it all just came together beautifully and was varnished within a week of the opening. It was a very dull color prior to varnishing it, and it just exploded with color, and it all, anyway, it's, uh, I have to say, the most rewarding piece for me in the show. Okay, uh, very quickly, this just cracked me up. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, Googled my name and, and this popped up, um, um, a stolen artwork of mine. <laughs> I guess this, you know you've made it when you, when you make a police blotter in the uh, LAPD. But what cracks me up um, is that these were, um, uh, these two sculptures uh, were a commission by a, um, a goth collector, and they were in her bedroom on either uh, in niches on, on either side of her gigantic four-post bed. And the thieves stole my brain, but left my heart. <laughs> and that says it all. <laughs> okay, and I'll leave you with this. Okay, here we go. That was the last piece I finished and finished it a couple of nights before the uh, installation of the show at Big. And with that, I'm done. So, thank you.